Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Good morning. As we return to our study in the book of Zechariah, shall we praise our Heavenly Father for the blessings that he has provided? And shall we look to gain wisdom by the warnings that are given by the spirit of prophecy so that we may more fully understand the time in which we live? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you united together to thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for these opportunities we have to learn of you, to learn that which needs to be corrected within our characters. Father, we ask now for your blessing and your guidance as we open your word. Help us to understand, direct our steps, show us that within our characters that needs to be changed. As we study this portion of Zechariah, understanding that we are being represented by Joshua, we see our great need of you and our great need <laughs> that only by faith may we accept the righteousness of Christ. May your angels attend us each one. May our minds be open to your guidance and correction. Direct us now for this we ask and this we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Now. Okay, Dwight, just before yes. you begin, I just want to make a couple of things. Sure. So, uh, one is Iran got in safely last night. Wonderful. So, so he's here, even though you see his, he's just got his phone there. That's why he's connected. I'm not sure why he's connected. Let's see the screen. Hmm? That way I can see the screen. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, because I can do this too. Like that, but... Anyway, he's going to look on his phone. Now, another thing we were talking last night um, about uh, Hiroshima, because there's this movie that came out yesterday called Oppenheimer. Oh, Oppenheimer. Okay. Oppenheimer. Okay. Yeah. And um, so we were discussing some things. Now, Now it's coming out on, well, it came out on July 21st, your birthday. So, right. Uh, which, of course, is a symbol for midnight. Now, uh, I have on my chart, uh, you know, Alamogordo, right? That's July 16th, but it's the fifth day of the fourth month. So it was midnight when they tested that bomb, like the symbol. And then they're releasing this film on July 21st, which is also a symbol for midnight. Um, so I haven't looked at the chronology of the release of this film in relationship to Hiroshima, but it'd be kind of interesting to do. Um, but, you know, we had Hiroshima, we had Alamogordo on July 16th, which was the fifth day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. And I remember seeing one of the major documentaries, I think it was like the first major documentary dealing with the, the testing of that bomb. Right. And when they got to July 16th, uh, you know, they had, it's, it's an older documentary. They just had, you know, it says July 16th, midnight. <laughs> so really? they had that midnight symbol you know, for July 16th, which of course is midnight on the biblical calendar. And then of course right. we know there was the Potsdam Declaration that was received by Japan and rejected on July 27th, Gregorian. Then Hiroshima was on the 26th day of the fourth month, which was August 6th. Um, and then Nagasaki on July 27th, Julian, which was August 9th. And then Konkura, which was originally when they planned to do the second bomb. Um, and when they moved it earlier uh, to August 9th, there still was bad weather. So they did it at Nagasaki. But Kakura was August 11th. So you have the other date 
Uh, so you got the Julian and the Gregorian for um, uh, in for July twenty seventh. You have the the biblical date twenty sixth day of the fourth month, uh, and then you also have Uriah Smith's August eleventh date, and then they surrender August fifteenth, the symbol for midnight or midnight cry. Pardon me. And then uh, they had a third planned attack called off. That was August 19th because Japan surrendered. Uh, that was the 10th day of the fifth month. And so I, I just think it's interesting that this movie comes out on such a significant date in the context of uh, this um, these charts dealing with national yes. and so forth. So I just thought should draw people's attention to that. And you know, now that I know about it, I'm going to kind of look at it a little bit from the chronology of what that means in relationship to these lines, but I haven't done that yet. So anyway, that's just a, a little note, side note. So you can go ahead there, Dwight. Okay. We're going to recap just a little bit from what we were addressing this last week and then continue within this study. It is kind of interesting when you look at this, especially with what Oppenheimer and others had done within the study of physics to bring about the nuclear bomb and its effect as a deterrent in the world of the type of war that they were facing at that point. Yeah, I don't think we all realize... Um you know, especially younger people, just the significance of what that nuclear test meant. Um, uh, so um, I know it was my mom's 15th birthday when the test occurred. Of course, she wouldn't have heard about it until a lot longer after it happened, or not the test, but the, the actual dropping of, of the bomb on August 6th on Hiroshima. Um, but But that really did change the world. I mean, we have a number of events that changed the world uh, drastically. One, of course, was Pearl Harbor. And connected to Pearl Harbor was the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. They're, they're connected through history. Right. And, and, and we have a, a similar thing uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989 and 9-11. And, and the connection there, of course, has to do with... Uh, uh, the Cold War um, ending uh, to some degree, but the, the battleground changing place dealing with Islam. And, and there is a connection, of course, between the Soviet Union and the churches of the East um, and Islam, right? So, um, so you know, these are our major events in history uh, that, uh, that, that happened in the past. And we're in right now in uh, the present and it's interesting how that past and present is connecting, which is uh, my first presentation on uh, um, Monday afternoon, dealing with the, how the past and the present are connected. Right. And okay. You, you did look at the you did look at the notes um, that we got. I sent those out. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the PDF or anything for the camp meeting, but it's got the, I haven't yet. It's got the schedule there and uh, I'm going to put out um, an email just uh, on Sunday, I think, uh, just with the notes and the explanation and for people to invite others that they think would be interested in these series uh, to participate. But um, so anyway, we, we got that, that stuff ready as well. Anyway, you can go on. Okay. As Mrs. White writes in this unpublished manuscript, the wisdom of God, his power, and his love are without a parallel. For this, we should thank our Heavenly Father because we obviously do not have the wisdom or the love to be able to do that which needs to be done. It is the divine guarantee that not one of even the straying sheep and lambs 
are overlooked and not one is left unsuckered. Now, I've always had issues with this word. So looking it up to understand what it means to sucker, which I pronounced in the past suckered, but sucred is an assistance in time of distress or relief. Yeah, well, I know the word from uh, suckering corn. Okay. But, I mean, that's that's what I've always attached the word to. And that's when you uh, you basically prune it, so to speak. You, you remove the cobs that aren't going to mature. You remove them from the plant. Um, and that allows the plant to continue to grow more strongly. Yeah, well, to put more to the to the cobs that aren't uh, that are already almost full. So okay, but that that's where I look at it, is look at it as helping. It's an aid, but you're saying in the time of distress or difficulty, right? Now, how do you get the pronunciation for that? You looked it up, right? I'm <clears throat> I'm using the American Heritage Dictionary. Okay. Because I know uh, Alexander, Alexander Scorby says sucker. Okay. Um, but that's, so that's probably the English pronunciation. But he also uses the word sloth instead of sloth. Right. Sloth rhymes with both. So you say sloth. But anyway, go on. Sorry about that. Not a problem. <clears throat> a golden chain. The mercy and compassion of divine power is passed around every one of these imperiled souls. Then shall not the human agent cooperate with God? Shall he be sinful, failing, defective in character himself, regardless of the soul ready to perish? Christ <clears throat> has linked him to his eternal throne by his offering of his own life. What kind of a picture does this present before us? Is God <clears throat> sinful, failing, or defective in character? No. Should we, <clears throat> when we understand that Christ is providing this link, to his throne. Should we be turning from this in any manner? When we're hearing about a golden chain. This again. Shows us. <clears throat> that. Not only is it important for us. In, in the acceptance of righteousness by faith, but it is of greater importance for us to understand this golden chain that begins in 677 and runs all the way through to 1844. Because the links in the golden chain have been established as waymarks for us to be able to walk by faith. Now, <clears throat> shall any man or woman be indifferent to the very souls for whom Christ is pleading in the courts of heaven? Who is Christ pleading for? Only those that believe in him? Who is Christ pleading for? The entire world. Exactly. Everyone. Does God want any to perish? No. Nope. 
Shall you in your course of action imitate the Pharisees who would be merciless and Satan who will accuse and destroy? Now here, the Pharisees would be merciless. Our adversary will accuse and will destroy. We need to keep this in mind. We need to remember that our adversary wants our demise. <clears throat> oh, will you individually humble your own souls before God and let that stern nerve and iron will be subdued and broken? Are we to battle on our own? Or has the battle already been fought for us? We need, by faith, to hold on to Christ. Step away from the sound of Satan's voice and act in his will. And stand by the side of Jesus, possessing his attributes, the possessor of keen and tender sensibilities who can make the cause of the afflicted suffering ones his own. The man who has had much forgiven will love much. How many of us can offer a testimony like the brand plucked from the fire? How many? Oh, man, I can. Okay. <clears throat> How many of us, recalling the paths, <clears throat> recalling the paths that we have walked in the past, can see how unworthy we have been, yet how blessed we are by the very presence of Christ and what he has been doing in our lives. Satan claims a right to have those who once stood under his black banner, but who have turned from sin to the living God and have cast their helpless souls upon Jesus. Now, Is this temporary? Is this a partial surrender? It's a hurry surrendering. It calls for 100% surrender. Amen. Every soul who takes hold of the merits of Christ by faith has the pledged word of God that they shall make peace with him. He says, let him take hold of my strength and make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, 5. Trials are permitted to come upon the chosen people of God. How often in trial do we fail to thank God? For what is it showing us when trials come? Is it not indicating to us that God is testing us so that our characters may pass through the fire of affliction so that they may be purified and prepared to be made white. God knows every heart, every motive, every thought in the heart of man, but he permits Satan to try and tempt and test his believing ones in order that their trust and confidence in God may be revealed. In the trial, if true to God, they reveal the fact that they render obedience to his written word. 
How important is it for us that we obey the word of God? <clears throat> All these trials and close personal tests <clears throat> are to result in magnifying the name of the Lord who is waiting to bestow strength and grace upon those who call upon him. The work of Satan is plainly defined as that of resisting the meritorious work of Christ. He resists him in his efforts to come to the help of the tempted and tried soul who calls upon him. So just as Christ stands as our advocate before our Heavenly Father, our adversary stands and tries to stand between us and Christ. When Christ steps in between the tempted souls and Satan, the adversary is angry and opens up with a tirade of abuse and accusation declaring that Christ is unfair in protecting these souls and in lifting up a standard against him. But the Lord says unto him, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Joshua is charged with being a transgressor of the law, and Satan is at hand to present his sin in the most aggravated light, even though he himself has, through his subtlety, led him to commit the sin. Like sheep, we have willingly followed after the adversary. He can't force us to sin, but the recommendation and the thoughts are placed. Satan claims Joshua as his subject. He represents him as one who is undeserving of the care and mercy and the love of God. This will be Satan's plea that his determined purpose in the last great conflict God accepts the faith that acknowledges Christ as the sinner's personal savior, and he looks with tender love and pity upon his believing ones. Now, Zechariah 3, 6. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Who here... <clears throat> is the angel of the Lord. Well, it's Christ. So, Christ is protesting unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shall also keep my courts. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. So if we're going to be keeping his charge, if we're going to be keeping his ordinance, are we not given a promise? But what is the ordinance that we're being charged to keep? In the book of Leviticus, we are presented, Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, that you die not. For so I am commanded. In 1 Kings 2, 3. 
and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whither soever thou turnest thyself. And then in Ezekiel 44, 16. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. Why is it important that we keep the ordinance of God? Please assume and it keeps us uh, safe and secure, keeps us close to him. Okay. <clears throat> now, this next letter was written to G.I. Butler on 6th of September of 1886. The 6th day of the sixth month of the biblical year of 5931. We must as a people arouse and cleanse the camp of Israel. Here we need to see Numbers 25, especially Numbers 25-2. And of course, there's no symbolism here at all, right? Yes. So if we are looking at Numbers 25, and we're looking at Numbers 25 too, it reads, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. This is the worship at Baal Peor. How are we to cleanse the camp of Israel today? That sort of is the question. I mean, it starts with us. Yes, it does. And and then a work is given to us, and that's the real difficult part. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, really, other than that God is doing a work and we participate with him. But that means, you know, preaching the truth, living the truth, um, and allowing God to... Uh, not hindering his work, cooperating with him. Licentiousness, <clears throat> unlawful intimacy, and unholy practices are coming in among us in a large decree. And the ministers who are handling sacred things are guilty of sin in this respect. They are coveting their neighbor's wives. And the seventh commandment is broken. We are in danger of becoming a sister to fallen Babylon, of allowing our churches to become corrupted and filled with every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. And will we be clear unless we make decided movements to cure the existing evil? Will you have others follow your example will you wish them to pass over the ground you have traveled and feel that they have done no great wrong without repentance and genuine conversion you are a ruined man now who is she writing this to 
Well, this is G.I. Butler, and he's the president of the General Conference at this time, I believe, in 1886. Right. So this is a couple of years prior to 1888. And G.I. Butler had had a controversy with E.G. Wagner. Um, um, and they he had written a book uh, basically refuting Jones and Wagner's view on Galatians. And then Wagner is going to respond. So it's in that history. So is she being supportive of Butler's position or is she warning Butler that his position is antithetical to that of Christ? She's warning Butler according, according to what she's writing. Okay. Now, she continues. Brethren, we must have genuine faith, which is the gold tried in the fire. So, if the gold tried in the fire is genuine faith, what is it to be made white? What, what can we apply in this warning to Laodicea that we need to pay attention with today? I mean, this is the garment of Christ's righteousness. Right. We must cherish that faith which works by love and purifies the soul. Unless our faith has a purifying influence, it is worthless. Such a faith leads the soul to God and expands the intellect while it purifies, ennobles, and sanctifies. What did she just say here? By faith, the mind becomes purified. It ennobles. It sanctifies. So we are lifted into a closer communion with heaven. Yeah, the, the problem for, for the average person, mm -hmm. uh, especially outside of Christian, uh, outside of Adventism, but even within Adventism, is a lack of appreciation of what the word faith means. Right. There, there's two sort of views that are both wrong. One is that it's, um, you know, uh, believing without evidence. That would be the world's view, right? So what we would call blind faith. And the other is this sort of willpower, somehow having enough faith to be able to um, move God's hand in your favor, which is really a, a very pagan idea of faith. Uh, but the faith, which is this abiding trust in somebody that you know and have confidence, that doesn't come about through sort of uh, any kind of intellectual uh, acknowledgement of something, it actually comes out through working with that person, right? If you're going to have explicit faith in someone, you need to know them. You need to have worked side by side with them. You can't just know about them. And, and so that type of faith, that's what Ellen White's speaking of. Okay. Let those in youth, those in mature age, and the aged consider that their cases are soon to pass in review before God. Is there anyone here that is not being addressed? Is she not telling us that all of our cases are soon to pass before God? What will be the record that they shall meet? At one time in Battle Creek, the scenes of the judgment were presented before me. The books were opened, and all, both old and young, who claimed to be keeping the commandments of God were gathered about the throne. In the books were written the thoughts, the words, the actions of those 
who had received much light and enjoyed many opportunities, and yet their names were not clear. Their life record was blotted and blurred. Great numbers were weighed in the balances and found wanting who knew for just what sins they were condemned. Do we seek to be like Belshazzar or do we seek to be like Joshua? It was because of the lack of a virtuous character. Base animal passions had controlled them. Licentiousness and lust had been carefully cloaked from human eyes. But the Lord saw it, and their names were blotted out of the book of life. This is a fearful warning many of these men claimed to be teachers of the truth but their labor was not marked with holy endeavor they had not confidence and boldness toward god they could not lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting and the words were pronounced to these sin polluted souls depart from me ye workers of iniquity Luke 13, 27. Now is the time to obtain the white robe of character. Now is the time to confess and forsake sin and come to God with contrition of soul that your sins may be blotted out and your names retained in the Lamb's Book of Life. <clears throat> we must do something to stop this terrible tide of moral impurity. Self-abuse stands as the most degrading sin, polluting the whole character of the man, unless those who are in practicing of this vice break off their sin and repent before God, they will find no place in the city of God. There entereth into that city nothing that defileth or maketh a lie. Such characters are living a lie continually. We are living in an age where iniquity abounds, and the special work of God's delegated servants must be to suppress this iniquity and to bring in righteousness. But those who claim to be the Lord's delegated ministers and yet corrupt their own ways before him are guilty of a great crime. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord saith unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Joshua here represents the people of God. And Satan, pointing to their filthy garments, claims them as his property over which he has a right to exercise his cruel power. But these very ones have improved the hours of probation to confess their sins with contrition of soul and put them away. And Jesus has written pardon against their names. There is a question that's been asked in the chat. And at this point, it may be better that I address this, the answer for this question directly but not within this meeting. So I'll look to see what can be done to put some, some data together for to answer this question. Those who have not ceased to sin and who have not repented and sought pardon for their transgressions 
are not represented in this company. For this company vex their souls over the corruptions and iniquity abounding around them. And God will recognize those who are sighing and crying because of the abominations done in the land. Here, we need to see Ezekiel 9.4. They were not mixed up in these abominations. They had not corrupted their ways before God, but had washed their robes of character and had made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Satan pointed to their sins, which had not yet been blotted out, and which he had tempted them to commit, and then reviled them as being sinners clad with filthy garments. But Jesus changes their appearance. He says, take away his filthy garments from him. Are we to resist Christ in this work? Are we to battle against Christ when he tries to take away the filthy garments? Or are we to cooperate with him? To cooperate with him. All right. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places among these that stand by. Zechariah 3, verses 4 to 7. After the filthy garments have been removed, the subject changes, showing that this is this has its application in the future. So here, Mrs. White is being very clear that she is writing not just to G.I. Butler in 1886, but she is giving a presentation that is now for us to consider. If the people of God will walk in the ways of the Lord and keep his charge, which is the Ten Commandments, then the promise is that they shall judge his house and have places to walk among the angels. Now, the question is, will those who profess the truth comply with the conditions? Will the characters of those who profess to believe the truth correspond with its sacredness? Satan's special efforts are now directed toward the people who have great light. Who is that? Who are the people that have great light? That would include us. Yeah, we're supposed to be. Will the characters of those who profess to believe the truth correspond with its sacredness? He would lead them to become earthly and sensual. Satan would lead them to become earthly and, sensu and sensual. There are men who minister in sacred things whose hearts are defiled with impure thoughts and unholy desires. Married men who have children are not satisfied. They place themselves where they invite temptation. They take liberties which should only be taken with their lawful wives. They fall under the rebuke of God. 
and in the books of heaven, adultery is written opposite their names. There should be no approach to danger. If the thoughts were where they should be, if they were stayed upon God and the med mediations of the soul, or excuse me, the meditations of the soul were upon the truth and the precious promises of God and the heavenly reward that awaits the faithful, they would be guarded against Satan's temptations. But by many, vile thoughts are entertained almost constantly. They are carried into the house of God and even into the sacred desk. I tell you the truth, Elder Butler, that unless there is a cleansing of the soul temple on the part of many who claim to believe and to preach the truth, God's judgments long deferred will come. What does this statement say to you today? Are we to allow the cleansing of the soul temple? I mean, God has been merciful. Yeah, go ahead, Angela. No, I was just not just again saying how much I, I marvel with how much patience God has with me and with, with all of us. Because uh, I'm going through a phase right now where there's somebody that I'm trying to encourage to come back to Christ, to consecrate herself totally to Christ, right? And uh, it's extremely trying and extremely difficult. And it looks like within the next month or so, I'll be staying here with her and her family and another fellow who is quite the trial. So please pray for us. I, I feel it might be their last chance to really come to God. Come to God. Well, you know, we can see God's patience with others, but God's patience with us, because uh, we know a lot more about ourselves, uh, really tells us something about God. But also that these judgments, they've been put off. Um, you know, God has dug around the fig tree and says, you know, let, let keep it this year also. But there comes a time when the fig tree has to be cut down. And um, God has been merciful. He's given us light, and this light is meant to draw us away from our sin, to convict us of our, our sin. We were studying with Jones last night, and just the idea that, um, you know, God's presence, the truth, uh, the reason why we need to be around people who don't know the truth is so that... Um, God's presence can come to them and cleanse them from sin. But that's not going to happen if God's, if we're not cleansed from sin. God's presence really can't be manifested. All we do is just talk of religion. But we need to reflect Christ's character. These debasing sins have not been handled with firmness and decision. There is roughness in the soul, and unless it is cleansed by the blood of Christ, there will be apostasies among us that will startle you. I ask myself the question, how is it possible for men who are opening scriptures to others, men who have abundance of light, men who have good ability, Men who are living as in the face of the judgment upon the very borders of the eternal world give their thoughts and their bodies to unholy practices. Whatever we do that tears down the body, whether it is from diet, whether it is from the admission of lust and lustful practices, whether it is from filling our minds 
with that which we should not? Are these part of what she is referring to here? She's very clear that where it comes to coffee and tea, just like with alcohol, that these are detriments that are to be avoided because of what they do to the body. There are many other situations that are for us the type of issues that we should be avoiding if we seek to walk closer with Christ. Well, many, well, may the words of the apostle be repeated with the emphasis. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. James 4, 8 to 10. Blessed is the man who endureth temptations, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Some have argued thus and thought that for certain reasons they have of their own. God would have them take the course they did, for God cannot be tempted of evil. Neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust, lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1, 12 to 15. Now, <clears throat> Mrs. White wrote the following manuscript, and it remained unpublished for many years. Satan, the rebel and apostate, works by every possible device to defeat the purpose of God. Because men have sinned, he claims that they have come under his dominion, and that the heavenly agencies angels that excel in strength could not take his subjects from under his control could men receive divine power he knows that he cannot prevail against them and that his work and work his will in cruelty upon my body and mind therefore he accuses them before god and claims that the power of god shall not be imparted to them so here we are as Joshua God is seeking to impart his power to us today our adversary doesn't want to see this happen Is this any different than what was occurring at the time of Nehemiah as the wall was being rebuilt? Zechariah the prophet beholds Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Joshua represents the people of God standing in the presence of their Redeemer. Does she make a clear statement here? Satan, with his masterly accusing power, is resisting the plan of Christ for the redemption of his people. The majesty of heaven, the only begotten of the Father, 
responds to Satan's claims. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Satan was charging God's people with impurity. He was presenting every defect in their character. Through his deceiving power, he had tempted them to sin, and now he represents them as full of transgression and defilement. He declares that they have come under his control and that they are subjects of his pleasure, and he claims the right to work his will upon them without interference from God in their behalf. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, answered and spake unto those that stood before him, his holy attending angels, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to Joshua he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. Jesus has borne the sins of the whole world. He suffered as man's substitute in surety. He has himself bridged the guilt that sin has made, that separated man from God and earth from heaven. With his own divine hand, he plucked the brand from the burning, that man might not suffer the second death. And I, the Lord, said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. And they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, the pure garments woven in the loom of heaven, the righteousness of Christ. And the angel of the Lord, Christ, stood by to behold the, just, the perfect justification of his saints. What steps do we see here? If the righteousness of Christ, the pure garment woven in the loom of heaven, is the perfect justification, then we need in our next step to learn more of the sanctification so that when we are presented with the judgment, we may leave knowing that we are found not guilty. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house as kings and priests unto to God, and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among those that stand by, the loyal angels of heaven. Verses 5 to 7. Here the curtain that separates us from the unseen world is lifted, and we behold the conflict that is waged over every soul who believes in Christ. All heaven is interested in the people who are walking the ways of the Lord and keeping his charge. Shall not the great love and care manifested by the world's Redeemer and all the heavenly hosts in our behalf arouse us to love and good works in behalf of our fellow men? For the redemption of the soul, the majesty of heaven yielded up his life, and all the agencies of heaven are engaged in tireless ministry. In view of what heaven is doing to save the lost, how can those who are partakers of the riches of the grace of Christ withdraw their interest and their sympathies from their fellow men? How can they indulge in pride of rank or caste and despise the unfortunate and the poor. 
Are we to turn away from those that to this world are the outcasts? Are we to turn away from those who to this world are the poor? What does God say at this time? Now, I found it very interesting. This document was unpublished from when it was written until November 8th, 1956. So we have a document that was written 12th of June of 1893. Is there a symbol for us in this date? One, two, six, and then two, one, six. We have one, two, six, which we would accept as being <clears throat> a factor of the 2520. We have November 11th, 11, 11 of 1956. We have a doubling. But what was the time in which this was actually published? Was it not soon after the church published its abomination, the questions on doctrine? Well, it's a year before. But they were in the That's process it. of putting it together. Yeah, I know. So they published it in, in, in 1957. So this is just actually a little while before uh, they published Questions on Doctrine. It's interesting, of course, we know November 11th is Armistice Day, or now it's called Remembrance Day. Uh, so that was the armistice in World War One, the 11th day of the 11th hour. Right. Uh, can't remember exactly how they did that um but you know of course we have it as a symbol the 11 generations to the flood the 11 generations after uh to the going down into egypt and uh of course daniel 11 11 and other examples uh, in the story of joseph the 11 years from when he's sold into slavery to the butler and baker in 11 years till his dream is are fulfilled. So, um, and obviously with the 26th day of the second month, that can be June 22nd symbol, 622. Right. <clears throat> and then the seventh day, eighth month, of course the seventh would be the Sabbath, the eighth is the resurrection. I also found it interesting that this would be the biblical year of 6001, according to the calendar converter. Why did not these brethren fall into line and place themselves in the channel of light? They were poverty stricken and knew it not. They were not working in Christ's lines. They were not softened and subdued by his Holy Spirit. They were so blinded that they could not see the strong beams of light that were coming from the throne of God upon his people. They heard not the voice of the true shepherd. They were listening to the voice of a stranger. Who are we to listen to today? We need to decide whom we are going to listen with and to whom we listen to. When I consider the infirmities of these misled brethren, I feel deep sorrow of heart that they did not plead with God. Bless me, O oh God, bless. Now I see my error. 
Thou art communicating to thy people the richest truths ever committed to mortals. These people are not Babylon, for thou hast given to them righteousness and peace and thy joy, that their joy may be full. Oh, why did they not open the door of their heart to Jesus? Why not have removed right there all that obstructs the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness, that they might shine to the world? While God's blessing was penetrating everywhere, while his presence was consecrating and sanctifying souls unto himself, why did they not place their souls in the channel of light? It was because Satan had cast his hellish shadow athwart their pathway to obstruct every ray of light. How could they come from that meeting when the power of God was revealed in so marked a manner and proclaimed that the loud cry was that the commandment-keeping people were Babylon? Satan was saying the same thing to Christ when Joshua stood before the angel. Satan was declaring his sins to be so great that he should not be restrained from destroying him, from destroying Joshua. <clears throat> the words of Christ are applicable to these brethren and to all who shall advance similar sentiments. The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel and stood before Christ. Who clothed him with filthy garments? And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord proclaimed unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Who is it that is going to judge the house of God? Where does this message first need to come? Is it not to the house of God? Are we not told this by Peter? Are we not told this in the visions granted to Ezekiel? The work of Satan is to cover the repentant, believing, commandment-keeping people of God with defiling garments. Jesus commands them to be clothed with his righteous garment, woven in the loom of heaven. What have our brethren Stanton and Caldwell been doing? If they had been commissioned of God to do this work, then they would not need to appropriate the writings of Sister White without consulting her or saying a word to her. If they have so large confidence in the work that the Lord has given her to do, why did they not advise with her and see if this wonderful message was in accordance with the instruction given her of the Lord. Why did they not have wisdom to work in the right way? But this is a spurious message of the same character of similar messages that men have claimed to have had of the Lord. It is not as the bright shining of a candle lighted from the divine altar. Now, we know uh, Brother Stanton in Caldwell, that was um, when we were studying A.T. Jones in 1893, General Conference Bulletins. Yes. That there was this telegram that um, Brother Caldwell had sent um, to Ellen White. And, and then she had responded. And um, now that's going to be 
I'm just trying to figure out the the context of that. Um, so, so where I have it, it's from her experiences in uh, Australia. That's where the quote is from. But this is at that same time. I don't know if this, I don't think this is the same letter, but, um, but they were, um, they were giving a counterfeit message regarding uh, basically the work of the latter reign. And, and they believed that they were to call people out of the Seventh-day Adventist church at that time. So, so these quotes here are always uh, given in the context of, you know, this is God's church and we should never call the church Babylon and so forth. Um, but I think there's more to that story based on the context of it. Okay. Now. What I'm doing, I'm, I'm looking at something. Okay. Initially, this was letter 34 of 1893, and that's refiled as manuscript 21, 1893. And here again, you're right. She is in New Zealand because this was written from Banks Terrace, New Zealand, and is the document that we were we were just addressing that was written June 12th, 1893. When this was finally published, it was published in the Review and Herald, November 8th, 1956. Yeah. So this was... Um... Uh, so he sent this to Ellen White, Banks Terrace, Wellington, right? That was a, I guess, a telegram, right? So he sends this letter from there at that time. Now, the letter that I have in response to what she says is not the same letter here, but it's at that time. Um, so that's where she was. She was in Banks Terrace, Wellington, which is in New Zealand, you say? Correct. Yeah, and so she got this letter uh, or telegram uh, from Brother Caldwell, and then she responded. Um, and, and he had sent it from Sydney. So Sydney, so he was in Sydney, Australia, and sent her this telegram. And this the way in which this, this manuscript begins states that those who have published the loud cry tract have not consulted me upon the subject. Mm -hmm. They have quoted largely from my writings and put their own construction upon them. They claim to have a special message from God to pronounce the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon. Yeah, that's in this letter here. Yep. So that is in response to that telegram then. Yeah. Yep. So that's kind of interesting. But it's when Jones was, because they were at the 1893 General Conference. And, right. and so she says, both these men, Brethren and Stanton, were at the General Conference. Could they not discern there the revelations of the Spirit of God? Could they not see that God was opening the window of heaven and pouring out a blessing? Testimonies had been given, correcting and counseling the church, and many had made a practical application of the message to the Laodicean church, confessing their sins and repenting in contrition of soul. They were hearing the voice of Jesus speaking to them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I will sup with him and he with me. So she says, Brethren Stanton and Caldwell had the same work of repentance and confession to do. So, I mean, this is part of the whole the whole problem dealing with the church because the people who tend to 
criticize the church and make these calls to come out of Babylon and that the church is Babylon. The problem is they haven't done that themselves, that they think that Babylon is a location, not a condition. And so they think that you can get out of Babylon by leaving the Adventist church, but you can't. Leaving a church isn't going to change your status with God. Right. And in the chat, the comment is, is made here again, that Ellen White says that the church was in danger of becoming sister to fallen Babylon. And I believe that's one of the comments that we, we read at the very outset of this meeting. If brothers Stanton and Caldwell have so large confidence in the work that the Lord has given her to do, why did they not advise with her to see if this wonderful message was in accordance with the instruction given her of the Lord? Why did they not have wisdom to work in the right way? But this is a spurious message of the same character of similar messages that men have claimed to have had of the Lord. It is not as the bright shining of a candle lighted from the divine altar. We see how human nature can be deceived. How human nature can be misled because Satan is allowed to step in between the human soul and Jesus. The word of Christ needs to be spoken with authority. Get thee behind me, Satan. Let me come close to my servant that he may not be overcome, that he may believe my words rather than the words of men, for what I speak is truth and righteousness. Please consider the words of Zechariah. Again, we find repeated Zechariah 3, 1 to 3. Satan was charging the people of God with all his attributes and presenting before them the sins that he had instigated them to commit satan clothed their characters with his own filthy garments of sin and nothing was lost in his reckoning of their misdeeds but these souls who were represented as wearing the black robes of satan's weaving in his hellish loom were not as appropriate representation for they had repented of their transgressions. What was the message of John the Baptist? Was it not repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Yes. Now, <clears throat> At this time, have we not seen that our adversary does not wish us to repent? The Lord who searches the hearts and understandeth the imaginations of the thoughts and set their sins. Go ahead. The Lord who searches the hearts and understandeth the imaginations of the thoughts had set their sins before them and had given them the promise. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. First Chronicles 28, 9. The Lord, the everlasting God, is ever present to observe to inspect and examine all things. Does this not tell us that the Lord is investigating to see if we will accept his ways and his righteousness? The hearts of all are read as an open book. 
The eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth. Second Chronicles 16, 9. God's people rescued from the fire by Jesus Christ have a sense of their sins and feel humbled and ashamed. God sees and recognizes their repentance and notes their sorrow for sin, which they cannot remove or cancel themselves. But as they pray, their prayers are heard. And this is the reason that Satan stands by to resist Christ, because he hears their prayers. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He regenerates the sinner and pardon is written against his name. This stirs Satan up to resistance. He steps in between the repenting, believing soul and Christ. He seeks to cast his hellish shadow before that soul to dampen faith and to make of none effect the words of God. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Let my light and my righteousness shine into the heart. If Satan stands between the soul and Jesus Christ, then the love and acceptance and pardon of Christ is eclipsed. What happens if we are not willing to accept the righteousness of Christ? Are we not then allowing our adversary to stand between ourselves? And Christ? Man will be constantly striving to prepare a robe of righteousness to cover his deformity and sin when Christ wants him to come to him just as he is and believe in him as his personal Savior. In his tender love, a forgiving Father brings forth his best robe in which to array his returning child. What parable are we are we observing here? Well, the prodigal son. Are we all not prodigals according to God? Have we all not strayed? Have we all not sinned? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel and stood before Christ. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, that is, the angels that do his bidding, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head, and they clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Joshua represents all of God's people who repent and believe and accept Christ as their sin pardoning Savior. Brothers and sisters, the challenge that we have today, the challenge that is before us in this next week, is are we willing to confess our sins, to repent of those sins, and to believe solely in Christ? Are we willing to accept him as our sin-pardoning Savior? Or are we going to try, through our own merits, to be justified before God? We're given a challenge. We're given a direction.
Are we going to accept Christ's righteousness or are we going to continue to try to believe that we are capable of gaining heaven through our own merits? Any other thoughts or comments as our time today is very close? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these warnings, for these words of wisdom, for these admonitions that had been written aforetimes, but are applicable now. Please forgive us, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us of our hardness of heart. Direct us now. Please guide us in all things. Help us, weak as we are, that we may become strong with you, that we may leave our hands in yours, and that we may walk the path that you would set before us. We thank you for this Sabbath, for the blessings that you are providing. We ask now that you be with us the balance of this day. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.